respect all archaeologists are, are interested in um, type of te technology. <coughs> but as before, we'll be taking the perspective of human behavioral ecology, so uh, it'll, it might be a little different uh, way of thinking about uh, technology than most archaeologists think uh, about. It. And uh, we'll, be, we'll begin here with a, a diagram that those of you in the, in the Olympics lecture have already seen. Uh, but uh, here it's not to talk about stone tools as much as it is to simply contrast uh, two different uh, te technologies so that we can um, sort of ask the question, what produces variation? in uh, hunter-gatherer technology, because there is enormous var variation. This is uh, a Bushman technology, technology. the uh, uh, Jitoisi. This comes from Richard Lee's uh, book on the, the Jitoisi, the Hung uh, Foragers in Bots Botswana. And uh, that's, that's not uh, everything. It's not all their material. Uh, things, their technology, but it's mostly, it's, it's pretty much everything that, that they uh, make and, and use. So you, you could say it's a very simple uh, te technology, although not a, not a, a stupid one. Uh, there, there's lots of skill that goes into making, making those, those things. Uh, then this is uh, an Inuit Technology from the Nubuguri on the northern uh, coast of uh, Alaska. And this is by no means all of their things. Uh, this is just, just a selection. I could have probably made two or three more figures uh, just like this one with more of their things uh, uh, in them. So, uh, the, the Inuit have a lot more stuff uh, that they use and uh, a lot more complicated stuff. Any, any one of those pieces is made up of a lot of different uh, pieces. It's, it's not a simple te technology uh, by any, any means, especially when you start thinking about boats uh, or kayaks, uh, uniac. Uh, kayaks, sleds, uh, and their clothing, which is also very, very uh, complicated, uh, but uh, remarkably well adapted to such a cold uh, environment. So the, the question is, what, what produces uh, this kind of variation in technology among foraging societies? <laughs> Uh, so, so one thing we can just first of all look at it is thinking about the functions of some of these these tools and, and, to, and to, I could run through lots of different tools here but really what I want to do is just contrast um, uh, fishing or uh, especially sea mammal uh, hunting technology with uh, land-based hunting te technology. And I, and I say that because this, the, the technology used to uh, go fishing, to get fish, or to get sea mammals, is among the, the most complex technology that hunting and gathering peoples have cre created uh, around the around the world. And when we say that it's it's complex, one of the things that we need to communicate with that is that it's an expensive te technology. And it's expensive really in a, a couple of ways. One is it's, a, it's expensive to, uh, to actually create it. Uh, if, if, if I ask you to make a simple spear to use today to get some fish so that we can eat dinner tonight, you could just take a stick and sharpen the end of it, maybe put a little bar on it, and that might work. It may not work really well, but it may work 
well enough to get us some fish to eat. Uh, but these are much more complicated pieces of equipment with detachable heads, and as you'll see there are heads that are designed to turn in certain ways. They've got cord attached uh, to, to them. They're, they involve a lot more time in their initial manufacture. And that's, that's going to be an important part of the question. What's, when is that initial high cost of making something worth <coughs> that, that initial high, high cost? We, we could go a step further and look at uh, nets. Uh, if we really want to catch fish in large numbers, a net, a small mesh net, is, is the best way to go. That's the easiest way to catch fish. Actually, the easiest way to catch fish is um, hand grenades or dynamite. That's the easiest way to catch fish, but uh, we'll, we'll leave that uh, technology aside. Uh, these, the, the, the more complicated a technology is, in addition to having a high startup cost, high initial cost, they're also going to have a high maintenance cost. You, you have to spend time fixing them. Hunter gatherers who use nets, for example, almost every evening, after they're done eating, they sit down and they fix the net. It's something that has to be done more or less every day. You know, modern fishers using nylon nets don't have to repair them every day. But a net that's made out of cordage, uh, string that's made from the bark of the trees, those nets have to be fixed constantly, all the time. They have to be, they have to be fixed. So there's also a high maintenance cost. Um, so why why is there why it is uh, sea mammal and fishing technology so uh, expensive? Well, one, one of the reasons has to do with its function. And there's a very basic difference between hunting an animal on the land and hunting an animal uh, in, this, in the ocean. For land hunting, what hunter-gatherers try and do is get a projectile into the animal. And uh, if they have poison available in their environment, they can manufacture, they'll put poison on the tip. Uh, but even if they use poison, the, what they, they try to do is get a projectile into the animal so the animal will slowly bleed. The, the weapons that hunter gatherers use are usually not strong enough to, to drop the animal right, right there, which is what most hunters want. They want to hit the animal, and they want it to die quickly. Partly because you don't want the animal to suffer, but also because you don't want to have to track it across the land. <coughs> uh, it's very difficult to do. Uh, I've tracked animals using on their, their blood uh, trails. It's, it's hard to do, and you often lose the trail. The animal will the cut seals up enough for long enough that you lose the, 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 blood, the blood, blood trail and you can't follow the, the animal. So the objective in land hunting is to hit the animal and then let it bleed or let the poison work. You follow the animal and either it dies or it becomes weak enough that now you can, you can kill it much more. <coughs> Hunting sea mammals is different. You can't just hit it and then follow the blood trail because it's in the ocean. Instead, your technology has to do something more. And that something more is it has to grab the animal and hold on to it so that you don't let it go. And you see this uh, it's in various kinds of uh, marine mammal hunting technologies. Uh, this example here is just uh, going after seals through the, through the ice. Now, 
in, in Wyoming, I have to explain this to people. Maybe in Finland, I don't have to explain this to people. Uh, so uh, these are some Inuit going after uh, seals in the in the winter. Uh, the seals maintain these breathing holes so that they can come up and get a breath because they're mammals. Uh, and the, the Inuit have got several <coughs> ways to um, to detect when a seal is under the snow. They can't actually see the animal. They're, they put things down there. Sometimes it's a little piece of bone with hair um, frozen on, onto it, and they'll look for when that hair moves. That's a seal breathing through the snow. They know there's a seal there, and they'll then just put their spear down through the through the hole. They don't actually see the the seal. They just spear it, and they're basically trying to spear it into its space. Uh, there's then a cord that comes back from the spearhead, and the spearhead is detachable. It will, it will come off. So the spearhead comes off, the seal dives, the line trailed away after the seal, and then you basically just hold on to the line until the seal drowns. Then you take out your axe and you start cutting a hole in the ice big enough to pull the seal up out. Uh, those uh, harpoon heads are sometimes barbed, or they may be what we call a toggling harpoon head, so the, the harpoon head goes in, you then jerk the line back, and it, it, it twists the head uh, horizontally so it can't, it can't come out. And, and that works very effectively, but it's a much more complicated piece of equipment than just a, a simple harpoon. Uh, some uh, Inuit will use a um, a sealskin uh, platter. They'll, 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 they, they, they butcher a seal so that they can take the skin off in one piece. Uh, sew up the ends good and tight. Uh, they'll, they'll take an end and they'll blow up the, the seal skin like a balloon. And we have a special stopper that they put in there and tie it tightly shut. So if they're going after something like whales or other seals, uh, they'll throw a harpoon into the whale and the toggling head attaches to the animal, there's a line coming back here, and the hunter then lets out this sealskin bladder, which is tied to the other end of the, of the rope. And the whale then sort of takes off, but you can follow it by following the, the bladder floating on the top of the water, so then you've got to follow it and follow it. If the whale tries to dive, which it will, it will find it very difficult to dive deep and pull that ladder down below the, the water. At this point, I usually ask my students if they've seen the movie Jaws years ago. This is a good shark movie, okay? Where that shark dives under the water carrying three, I think, 55 gallon <laughs> drums of. Of, of air, and they're all amazed that this shark can dive with those three. Actually, it could never have, have dived and carried those three under the water. It, it can't be done. Uh, but it makes for scary movies. Uh, but that's what they're doing there, is, is that the animal will try and dive, and it's dragging this, this Air down with it when it can't. It can't do it. It starts to tire out. It's more and more tired. You keep following it on your kayak. It finally gets tired and has to rest. That's when you come up and put some more spears uh, into it. But all of that 
function of those of that tool requires a whole lot of extra technology to it. You need a toggling head, a harpoon, you need a, a, a spear shaft that's designed for the head to detach from it, you need the cord, you need the steel skin ladder, you need the, the stopper to put in the, the, the bladder. You need a, a whole bunch of extra things uh, in order to hunt sea mammals as opposed to land land mammals. So the technology uh, uh, to, to hunt sea mammals is automatically much more complex than the technology to hunt uh, land So we can we can we can use that that fact and the diagram model to think about what factors uh, affect foreign <coughs> te technology and and we're especially concerned here with food getting te technology. There are lots of other material things that hunter gatherers may can use. Uh, where we're particularly concerned with technology they use to get uh, food. You'll, you'll remember that in the diet prep model, there's, there's two important uh, elements to it. One is the, the search costs, and then what we also call the, the, the handling costs. How much time does it take to find a resource, and then how much time does it take to acquire that resource once you found it? What technology is designed to do is reduce one of those costs. That's what that's all the technology, food giving technology, is, is intended to do. It's trying to reduce those, those costs. If I can make it that I can find animals more quickly, I reduce my search costs. If I can acquire food more quickly, once I've found it, I've reduced my handling costs, and I've consequently raised the post-encounter return rate. And we can think of technology as trying to do one of these two things. So, what does a snow machine do? It's a little back and forth for everything. It can move you yeah. more quickly, yeah. right? Which means it will reduce search costs. All tree hunters in Canada have snow machines. They often can't afford them, but they can't afford to not have them because it reduces search costs so dramatically. In the winter, they can go out and very quickly cover areas looking for moose tracks. Find moose tracks, sit there, look at them, to decide how, how long ago was the moose here, which direction is it going, where is it going. But the more tracks you can sort of find, the more likely you're going to find a moose that's going to be easy for you to kill. So, that's what that's what this technology does is it reduces search costs. That's that's how we can think of it. Why does it matter? It matters because it reduces search search costs. It's it's a little hard. There's not too many kinds of technologies that can reduce search costs. Much of that is going to be reduced by sort of information that you have about, about animals. Information, things that I've mentioned before, things like what season is it, what time of day is it, what's the weather been like, what's the ground surface like, what's the, the forage for animals like at different places on the landscape. You use all that information to sort of decide where am I most likely to find moose or whatever. Technology doesn't do a whole lot to reduce search costs. Snow machines work great. Uh, the, the anthropologist's research vehicle 
also works for, for, for reducing search, search costs. So what technology can often do is reduce the harvesting, the, the handling costs, and constantly raise the posting counter return rate of our users. This becomes especially important as you start using um, uh, resources with lower and lower post encounter return rates. Anything <clears throat> you can do to raise those post encounter return rates is, is going to increase your overall foraging return rate. And as human behavioral ecology, we assume that that's the goal of hunter gatherers. They're always trying to increase that uh, overall return rate. So um, something like seeds. I've used the example of rice grass seeds uh, a couple of times uh, in here. And the first time we did that, someone pointed out it's a very low return rate. And it is indeed. And most seeds, in fact, have low return rate. And, and the, the interesting thing about that is that most of what we eat today comes from seeds. Maize, wheat, barley, rye, millet, these are all seeds. It's kind of interesting that the resources that were low range to hunter gatherers eventually became the, the resource that feeds 7 billion people. Uh, and we can see that this is, um, these are just some general classes of foods, nuts, grains, seeds, uh, meats, fruits, and, and vegetables. And the, the mean, you can see that in the back here, the, the mean return rate for seeds is, is the lowest mean of these four classes of, of, of foods. It's got a range in, in there, but the, but the mean value is the, is, the, is the lowest. These generally have low return rate. They're, they're low rank foods. We don't expect them to be used until high rank foods have become more rare and less abundant on the landscape. Remember? That's, that was the dot growth model. We use lower rank foods and higher rank foods less uh, abundant. So uh, it's not surprising that in many places in the world, seed processing technology is, is rather weak in world prehistory. Uh, I, I, I know it best for North America. People have been in North America since at least uh, 13,200 years ago, probably a little earlier than that. Uh, but seed processing technology only shows up about 9,000 years. So people are here living perfectly well, apparently, for at least 4,000 years or so um, before they start harvesting seeds. And you can eat seeds without, without grinding them on uh, grinding stones like this uh, Australian Aboriginal woman is doing, or without pounding them up in these stone uh, uh, mortars, you can eat seed, but you won't you won't get much food value out of them because a lot of them are going to pass through. There's more food value if you grind them up. So grinding them up is really a way to increase their uh, post encounter return. As the post encounter return rate for seeds, if you just eat them raw and rely on your teeth to grind them up, is fairly is even lower than the saw for rice grass seeds. So we we developed this technology, hunter gatherers developed this type of technology in order to raise the return rate of seeds over their return rate. You don't process them at all, or you just rely on your jaws to process them. So it's 
technology can be seen as a as an effort to sort of raise the posting counter rate <coughs> of various resources. Like I said, if 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 they can use some technologies to reduce search costs, but most technology is designed to uh, raise the posting counter return to reduce the, the handling cost of, of the food. Does that make sense? So uh, can we use that observation to try and understand uh, the, uh, the, the variation that we see in hunting gatherer te technology? This, this is a, a diagram uh, that comes from a paper by Dwight uh, Reed a few, a few years ago. And he, he took uh, information that on uh, the technology of uh, a number of different hunting and gathering uh, groups from around the world. And this is information that was gathered by uh, the anthropologist Wendell uh, Oswald. I don't know if anyone's familiar with his. He published a couple of books, one in 73 and one in 74, on te technology. And they're, they're they're interesting books, and many people have, have taken his data set and uh, used it in a, a variety of different, different ways. Uh, but he came up, he, he recorded technology in, in several different, different ways. But one of the things he talked about were what he called complex uh, tools. And for him, complex tools were tools that were made up of several parts and that had parts that moved relative to the other parts. So things like uh, a detachable harpoon head is a more complex tool than a, a simple harpoon that whose head is not det detachable. Um, a harpoon that's just a stick, a pointed stick, this. Harpoon. It, it won't work very, very well, but it might work a little better. That's that's a very simple tool. It has one part. If I add a detachable head to it, it's got two parts. If I add a, um, a cord to it, that's that's a third part. Uh, there are some harpoons that have ten or eleven different pieces to them. Um, so he came up with a definition of of complex tools, and uh, here we took Wendell Oswald's data, and he's just looking at the, the number of complex tools here. It's, it's the log of it, but don't worry. Looking at the number of complex tools here, and then for various reasons, he he looked at those data relative to the growing season how long the growing season was for a group times the number of residential moves per year. The length of the growing season times the number of residential moves per year. And what we can see here is as this value gets smaller, the number of complex tools gets larger. The relationship is like this. Okay? So as your growing season gets shorter, and or as your uh, mobility becomes less, as you as you move less and less, you your tools become more, more and more complex. These groups up here are uh, mostly Arctic groups, not all, not all Arctic groups, mostly Arctic groups who live in the Arctic, so they have a very short growing season, and they are quite, uh, they're not very mobile throughout the winter. They're generally living in large, uh, usually uh, 
pit house village, villages in, in the winter. So they have a short growing season. This is a small number. And they don't move very frequently during the year because they're, they're, they don't move during the winter. So a small number times a small number is a small number, right? So uh, on the other hand, these folks out here, and in the knees, Aranda, Kiwi, uh, are folks that live in near tropical environments, so they have a long growing season, and they're very mobile and move very, very quickly. Does that make sense? So it, it's, it seems that as foragers live in colder environments, and especially if those foragers don't move very frequently, they, those are the ones that develop very complex tools relative to other hunter, hunter data. Now, why, why is that? result of several yeah. several variables. One of those is certainly risk. That uh, uh, risk is inherent in hunting and gathering. Every time you go out to forage, you may have some idea of what you're going to collect, but you know that there's a chance you're going to fail. All this. Certainly hunting large game is more often not successful than successful. Uh, the, the success rates on hunting large game are actually quite low. Men come home empty handed more than they come home with a kill. In, in a very cold environment, uh, you can't really afford to fail though. If you're a seal hunter, a uh, net silic, um, or back in the Inuit seal hunter in the winter, you can't afford to fail. Because there's no other food coming back into camp. A Jutois hunter, if he fails, well, one of two things can happen. One, he'll stop and collect some bongo nuts or dig some tree birds, pick some berries, gather some seeds on his way back. Was not successful, so but he can pick up something else on the way home. Even if he doesn't do that, he knows that his wife is out collecting plant plant. So if he fails, well, that's too bad. They would like to have had some meat tonight, but it's it's not. They're not going to go hunting because either he can pick up some food or his wife is back. It's an environment that has risk, but the cost of the risk. Is not very high. <clears throat> the, the cost of the risk involved in, in hunting. But for a seal hunter in the winter, this is that's it. There's nothing else that they can get. The Netsilic are living on the frozen surface of the sea in the winter. The only thing they can take are seals. If they don't get seals, if their wife is not going to bring something home because she's not out digging tubers on the surface of the ocean. And there's nothing else that they can turn to because there's nothing else for them to get. If they're going to go after seals, they have to get the seal, which means their technology is designed so that it won't fail. It can't, it can't fail. If 
they steer that seal, they're going to get it because they design their technology, both the knowledge, but also the material pieces of design that they won't, they won't fail, or at least the failure rate is very, very low. Where they fail some, sometimes is they'll stand there all day with their, their spear waiting and waiting, but the seal doesn't come to that hole because seals have several holes. So the Nancylic field exists by living in fairly large groups when they're out of these sealing camps so that there's a man covering all the, all the holes. Someone will get the seal. And it's usually a big enough resource that it'll feed a number of, of families. That's cool, by the way, are really interesting that if uh, their, their ability to they have remarkable patience. They have to. Because they'll, they'll stand like this just all day, waiting to see the evidence that there's a seal breathing there. So they've developed all things like songs and they make up all these very, very long, complicated stories that they'll then go back and tell tell people. All of this to sort of relieve the boredom of just standing there and waiting and waiting. And it's it's like you know, 40, 50 degrees below zero. It's freezing cold. They don't move. No. And they don't move. <laughs> they can't. They can't. Even, even inside, you, you, uh, you know, it's yeah. really strange to not to move. Yeah, so it's not, not move when you're cold. Yeah. They'd like to move around, but they can't do that because then yeah. the seal will hear it. Yeah, I know. And the seal won't come up if they hear noise because they don't think it's a, a bear. Yeah. Uh, okay. So they won't move. So, yeah, yeah very, very interesting. Uh, so these, these very complex tools are designed to reduce those, those the, the handling costs of, of seals so that you don't have to go after the seal. You get it first time. It's, it's, it's designed to get that. And, and they want to raise that return rate in part because of the enormous risk involved. These folks don't have that, that pressure on them. So they can work with some rather generic tools that will fulfill a number of different purposes, but they're not designed to get a particular resource. The, the, the Inuit, if you could go into an Inuit house back 100 years ago, you would have found uh, uh, arrows and also atlas darts, but different kinds different kinds that are designed to hunt birds in different seasons of the year. And different arrows that are designed to hunt different species of, of, of birds at different times of the year. They're, 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 the, the, the instruments that they use are all designed for particular animals, particular times of the year. Very, very specific. There's all costs involved in that. And all of that cost is reduce the risk, which raises the post encounter return. So you say the same thing that all of these seal hunters, they have a really good looking to do a journey. They fail to get the seal, so we have to be in the time. What about what about these species that are not able to do it? When they're out on the, on the surface of the ice, they're looking for seals. Um, there are times in the year when they they do go after fish. Um, but for them, fish is not significant in the winter. They go after fish in the springtime and then in fall. But that's because the fish are moving up the rivers. And they go and fish them in the rivers, not out on the surface of the, of the ocean. During the winter, there, it's, it's, that's it. They may transport some dry fish out there, but they mostly need food. What, 
what Igor comes to mind is a, a monstrous, uh, this um, elaborate uh, technology that they have is related to the time they have also uh, created. <laughs> and the Eskimo have a lot of time. Uh, because they're sitting around, usually through the winter, with yeah. not much to do. Uh, so they're manufacturing stuff. They actually dug a dam for the police at some point. Uh, I, I don't, I, I don't think that's so important. If if other hunter gatherer groups need the time, they'll find mm -hmm. uh, the the Mikaya, uh, They take um, bark particular species of tree that can strip it off in these long pieces. And they'll um, roll it. They take three pieces, put three pieces together, and then they, they roll it on their, their thighs like that. And they just keep moving down, rolling the three strands together. And they just sit around the fire at night, especially the old men. They'll just sit there carrying on a conversation and they're just rolling quarters the whole time, just rolling quarters, rolling quarters. I don't know what they're going to do with it, but they just they just make quarters because someone always needs the, the strength. Uh, they weave their their fanny packs. That's what they do. They weave it out of that that bark from the cord. Uh, so they they have time to sit around. And Invest in te technology. I don't think it's simply a matter mm -hmm. of a uh, group having having time, because there's always something else you can do. So if if you've got time, it's always a question of what am I going to do with this? What, mm -hmm. what can I do with it? Uh, and if you invest it in technology, you're not doing something. With it. So. Investing in technology must be more important than the other things you could be, could be doing. That's that's the assumption mm -hmm. human behavioral ecology works works with. The other thing you can guess from from this is uh, that the longer you're going to use a piece of tech technology, the, the, the more you're going to invest. Uh, if 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 we need to if we get trapped you know uh, uh, out on a up at one of the lakes in eastern Finland and and oh we're gonna have to spend the night here but we'll go back to town tomorrow what are we going to do tonight well we might make some very simple spears and go down to the lakes and spear some fish. No fishing is part of the world, so I don't know if we can do that or not. But, but we could go down and, and do that. But now, a, a, and a very simple spear would work. Now, what if we're going to have to live on those lakes? And we're going to be eating fish all the time. Well, then you might say if it, it's going to be worth gathering the tree bark. Rolling it into cordage, weaving a net together, and we'll make a net to, to then go fishing. Because with the net, I'll have a higher post encounter return rate than I will with my simple spear. We all have a sense that that's, that that's true. So it's, it's all a question of is it worth investing in the technology or not? And one of its one of the reasons will be the length of time that it's going to be used. So, uh, how can we figure that out? Well, of course we're going to do it with some with some charts and graphs. Uh, I changed this around. I have to look at this.
just a moment. Um, yeah, we can we can imagine that uh, in this case, let's imagine two two different tech technologies that are both designed to go after uh, marine uh, mammals. We could use just a simple barbed spear, okay? Simple spear with some barbs that will cut on the end of it. That might that might work. It might work okay, not really great, but it, it might work okay. Or we could make ourselves a toggling harpoon, like like we saw in some of the previous pictures, with a detachable head, um, a, a pivoting uh, point on it, a cord attached to it, back to the spear. It'll probably work better, but it will take a long time to make relative to our barbed spear. So this is just manufacturing time. This one can be manufactured fairly quickly. This one is going to take us longer to manufacture. The barbed spear will give us one return rate, post-encounter return rate. The toggle and harpoon will almost certainly give us a higher posting count return. We can imagine that this one, if we spear an animal, we'll get it. That's it. We're going to get it. We can imagine with our barbed spear, we might spear uh, a seal or a fish and pull the spear back to pull it onto land, and ah, we lose it. It slips off the, sp the spear. So we try it again. And we'll, we'll probably get a fish for every three or four that we spear. With this one, we'll probably get it on the first time. So the post-encounter return rate will be higher. Everything's a trade-off. This does a better job, but it's gonna, it, it will cost us more time to, to make it. Not, not just in the actual manufacture, but also going out to get the different pieces that I'm going to need in order to put that complicated piece of technology all, all together. So which one would we, would we use? And one of these, this technology gives us a higher post-encounter return rate. Isn't that what we always want to do? We want to have as high a post-encounter return rate as possible. But this technology gives us a higher rate of return relative to the manufacturing costs. Okay? And, and you, you already know the answer here. It really has to do with how long are we going to use this piece of technology. If it's just tonight, we just want to feed ourselves tonight, ah, we'll, we'll get away with the barbed spear because it has a higher return relative to the time we have to invest in making. If we're going to be spearing um, fish for the next year, well then, it might be worth investing the time in a toggling harpoon because we'll get this higher return rate, which then compensates for the extra time that we're going to put into its manu manufacturing. Uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a graph, but it's a graph that's portraying what, 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 what you already know to be, to be true. So when would um, a more expensive technology replace a less expensive technology?
you can't see it in the back of the room there. There is a, a vertical axis there, which is measuring the, the return, the overall return from these two technologies. If we want to figure this, this out, we can go back to the marginal value here. I told you, we would see this again. It's a, it's a, uh, a model that has lots of other applications. Because as I, as I said, it's, it's just a model of when should you stop doing one thing and switch and do another thing. Uh, and we can apply that in lots of different, different areas. So here we've got um, one technology, our barbed spear, and here we've got our toddling harpoon. We can sort of think of a technology as, as being like foraging in a patch, in that we can, we can take a basic technology, like our barbed spear, and we can add a few uh, additional things to it. We can put a little more uh, effort into its manu manufacture. For example, I could start out with just a sharp stick. And then maybe I can put one bar on it. I could add a second bar or a third bar. Maybe I want to add a little weight onto it so it has a little, it goes into the water with a little more force. I can, I can, I can put, I can invest a little bit more time in its manufacture, and I, I would expect that that the return from my effort is going to go up. My, my return might actually start to go down if I invest time in the manufacture of my barbed spear, but I invest it in ways that really don't increase its effectiveness. For example, I could hang it red because I have some idea that that's going to help its effectiveness. It probably won't. So that'll be time that I put into the manufacture, and that's time I'm not using my piece of technology, so my overall return rate, my overall return will start to go down. You see what I'm, it's very similar to foraging in a patch for berries and eventually having to eat some of the berries. So I'm spending time eating berries instead of collecting <coughs> berries, my overall return will start to go down. I could elect to uh, put, invest my time in a toggling harpoon, and likewise, I can make initially a toggling harpoon, or I can add embellishments to it. I can add extra things to it, and in the same way, increase its return, although again, I could add so much additional things to it that actually don't perform a function. And it's red. I could add feathers to it. I could do something else to it that doesn't that, that might do something for me um, in some other way, but it doesn't do anything for the function of the, the tool. It doesn't get me, it doesn't uh, increase my, my post return. Now we know that expensive technologies like Todd and Harpoon do indeed replace cheaper technologies like Bart Spear. <laughs> How can we, why would that happen? Under what conditions can we predict when that would happen? Well, we, we saw this model before, um, and, and we saw that this distance here, this, this variable here that we're calling z, could be the distance to the next patch. Um, we saw also it was how else did we distance to the next patch. In this case, we can think of it as the amount of time that we're going to use something. If you look at it this way. Um, 
if I if I've got my technology, my simple bar of spear, and I've just manufactured a basic a basic <coughs> sharpened stick, that's going to give me one one return rate. As I start adding things to it, the return rate is is inevitably going to decline as a function of the fact that I'm in the return rate relative to the manufacturing will start to decline because I'm investing time in manufacturing it rather than in using it. And at some point, the return rate that I'm experiencing, remember that's just a line that's tangent to a curve at this point? At some point, the my return rate will be exactly the same as the return rate if I were using a toggling harpoon. That is, my line that's tangent to this curve will be shared with this more expensive te technology. At that point, at that point, I should shift to the more expensive te technology. Because my return relative to my manufacturing time is the same. And if I keep investing in this simple technology, my return relative to manufacturing time will simply go down. It's a foolish thing to do. What I should do is shift to the toggling part. My time will be better, will be better spent by investing in that little more expensive technology. It now makes the initial upfront cost of that expensive technology worth worthwhile. So all I have to know is what's this what's this time here? As soon as my use time is going to be higher than Z, I should switch tech, tech, technologies. And that's exactly what we said before. If you're going to use this technology just for a night, then just use the simple technology. But if we're going to be using it for a longer and longer period of time, the investment in this simple technology at some point is not, is not worth the effort. You should jump, make the leap to the more expensive te technology. And how we solve it, we already know how to solve it. We just solve for Z, which we did before by calculating the slope of this, this line and then solving it for, for Z. It's exactly the same thing we did um, previously. This So if you just want to stick some numbers in there to see how it, it works, um, we, can, we can put those numbers in there. If we can uh, guess that um, this technology takes uh, three hours to make, this one takes six hours to make, that technology provides you with a, a cumulative return of two units of the resource, whereas this more expensive will give you three units of the resource, we can calculate using this formula. We just plug those numbers in and we can say that if you're going to use it, that technology for more than three days, then uh, more than three hours, you should switch to the more expensive te technology. Those are silly numbers. We don't, they're not necessarily accurate at all. Um, but they just give you an idea of how you can how you get accurate. The hard part, of course, is not the model, but it's getting the numbers put into the model. So if we really want to know how, how, how much time does it take to make a simple spear versus a toggling harpoon? I don't know how long it takes you to make a toggling harpoon. One would have to have some measure of that, at least some relative. How, how good is each technology at what it's supposed to do? 
we have to go out and do experimental work with each of those technologies and record the, the data. There's really no ethnographic data that you can do. Yeah, I was, I was just curious. I know it's fine, but um, what about the social aspect of this tool and everything? I mean, from, for example, Inuit, they were not always only in Harvey to get food or mm -hmm. just prepare food that's food that's possible. Mm -hmm. They make art and I think it's, it's very, very detailed piece, piece of art, figurines mm -hmm. and so So they had some. Yeah. And every, all the nature, they had some, I don't know, Investing in that to make something beautiful to make art to have around the house? Actually, no. Those things all take part in those large, um, elaborate social rituals that the hot latch is the best known. And they, they play a role. They're, we'll, we'll talk about them, I suppose, tomorrow when we talk about cost of signal. Those things are all there to demonstrate someone's power. Story. It's like in the you know the the artists and the musicians that the royal courts of Europe used to support. Those are those were there primarily for a king to demonstrate his his powers. I have the best musician. Uh, and I can support this musician, and it does not weaken my power. It's, it's really a point taking a very cynical view on it, uh, but that's what those things do. That's what elaborate art can, can do it can communicate power. That's really what it is. So it doesn't enter into this uh, at all. It's power and it's also the functions of the community, of the functioning well, so you know your role. And, and I'm not sure what the time is. Okay. Um, so I was thinking about the power of the tool, is there some Well, maybe I also lost the idea. Yeah, I can talk about it. The 
there's a couple of interesting observations that come out of this approach to uh, food getting te technology. Um, one of them is that uh, there will almost certainly always be an overlap in time between two te technologies. It, it would be unlikely that one technology would completely replace an, an earlier te te technology. They probably overlap in time. Whether it's archaeologically detectable or not, I'm, I'm, I'm not 100% really sure of that. But they should overlap in time. And the reason they would overlap in time is we can guess that certain families or certain groups within a region would reach this point uh, when other groups or other families had, had not. So somebody may not feel the need to switch a technology, whereas someone else in the group will feel the need to, to switch that te technology. There's, there's variation in here, in other words. But, but we should expect some overlap between the, the two technologies. But we should never expect to see uh, three technologies that accomplish the same thing. We shouldn't expect to see three different technologies overlapping with one another. Why? No, they're not having to do with seasons. We wouldn't expect to see three technologies. Two, yes, two could overlap, but three, we would, we would not expect to see three. Yeah, the another new version was the second, the first one that's obsolete prior to the introduction of the third one. Uh, the, that's close. <laughs> the reason is, that if we had a, in order for three technologies to exist at the same time, recognizing that there's always going to be some little bit of variability in how strongly particular families or particular groups feel the need to switch a technology, in order for you to have three existing at the same time, there would have to be a third curve here, and all three of those curves would have to share a single line that's tangent to all three curves. That's highly unlikely. The, there, if there's a, a third technology, it might only come up you know, here. It might raise the return over this one only slightly. Or it might raise the return enormously over the second technology, in which case the second technology would simply be uh, leap, leapfrogged. They would just ignore it entirely and jump up. If there was a third technology, this one would share a line with it, tangent to it, before it share a line with this one. So you, you, this technology would just be ignored. You would forbid it. It's like um, uh, people in uh, some African nations who have gone straight from no telephones to cell phones. They bother with land, land, landmarks. They just leapfrog that, that te technology. It's because of this. Uh, so you would. The, the chances that you would have a third technology here that would share uh, a line tangent to these these two technologies is extremely low. What, what about the, the situation that you had cell cell system is different? You have, you have for instance, a third opportunity, and uh, if you have to keep cell cell system to take the third. You will maybe need uh, cooperation with someone so that you could 
third perpendicular increase or rate for one step. We can take it here and take it here. We do just have something common. Common you can do something. Still model that situation in this in this fashion. Um, the exactly what I mean we've talked about manufacturing time here. I, I mean I admit that I think about it in very simple terms of how long does it take me to get the material I need, how long does it take me to fashion it so that it all goes together makes my modeling my opinion. But some of the costs that could go into that uh, could be things like that. access to the appropriate places to get the things I need and that there may be another social group that's, that's, that's there. Um, there. There could be certain kinds of knowledge that I must acquire before I can use a particular technology. And it, it, it may be uh, actual practical knowledge. It may be more, some more spiritual knowledge that I've got to acquire before I can, I can use it. Uh, but, but those costs could all be modeled into this. So I'll just introduce further costs to it. Other costs that you're talking about it could entail shifts in the culture of a society. So if you have a society where men hunt individually, for some reason you want to shift to using communal technology, using hunting fences, nets. Spread through the forest and then into the community. There's, there's probably some lag time involved in that because there are certain cultural ideas about the appropriate way that you go about hunting and should do it alone rather than hunting. My assumption is always that if there's a real uh, material need to shift from one form of activity to another, that culturally the shift will be made. It may be made slower than you might expect, but eventually it will be made. And I, I admit that I approach all of these models from the point of view of an archaeologist, and from the point of view of the kind of shifts and the sort of behavior that's reflected in archaeological data. And archaeological data doesn't show short-term shifts, at least not very long. It shows very well sort of longer-term major shifts in human behavior. And I assume that some of that behavior may entail some cultural shifts, but uh, and that they may add up. At, at one scale, they can slow a process down. 
and appear to even hold it up. But if there's a real material need for it, I assume that the ship will eventually. I wish I had some good examples to give you. Um, it is uh, but there really aren't any. Uh, partly because the, the data we would need to put in that equation is, is really not, not known. How long does it take to make a a simple self bow and arrow. How long does it take to make it? Do you know? No. Because I don't know. So I was thinking that maybe people just take up you know, it just comes like this story. When you mention it's coming, it will take time. It's not. It's by no means a simple process. And you're, you're <coughs> right that some new technology comes into this society. And that technology carries some, uh, some symbolic weight, carries some cultural weight to it. Uh, it's, uh, the, the, and, and we all know this. Uh, I mean, you can look at just furniture in the, in the house, or the furniture we have in, you know, institutions versus what you have in the house. They're always, they're, it's not the same, the same thing. Because partly, the, the furniture is there to communicate a symbolic message that it's telling you something. Uh, and that's, that's true of any technology, especially technology that's introduced from outside into a, a, a society. So it, it, this, is just, this is just like the, the question of the diet breath model. How do you, what if food is taboo? Or what if a, a resource is taken for some reason other than food? The, the, the diet breath model should all point that out to us. In the, in the same way, if you use a model like this, it should tell you when a technology is being used for something other than it's purely material of uh, 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 impact or effect. Is it, is it okay? Yeah. Uh, it's, this, we, we have to remember any model I'm presenting here is here's how we expect people to behave if their goal is to maximize their uh, their overall rate of return from hunting and gathering. There are, that's not the only thing that matters to people. So we don't expect this model to be reality. If I thought this model was real, I'd say there's no need to take it to the archaeological data or to the ethnographic data. Why bother? We know it's real. Well, I actually know it's not real, but I want to use it as a way to explore archaeological or ethnographic data in order to, to learn what were the important variables in my archaeological or ethnographic case. None of these models are the answer. They're the answer if their principles are the only guiding principles but we know that they're not. I think these help us to figure out what the other principles are 
when they're operating and when they're not. Not the answer. It's, like I said, it's a, it's a, they, these are learning strategies. That's that's all. Take a break. It's, it's, they don't have to carry it, but still, it's, it's, it seems to be 
But this is quite a, 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 a very sort of a reliable source. I mean, it's not a, I mean, everything else that would be the thing. But this was a, I don't know if it's something in search of, but maybe somebody has done it once, but, uh, or, but it does seem that this also, if you think that, well, there's 100 that we even take that, that's, uh, that's 85 kilos. Well, it's just in two days of work, they do the... Yeah, exactly, yeah. one cow. So, I mean, so it, it, in a way, it's actually very, not very labor demanding. <laughs> <laughs> But, but the, I don't know what do we do. Oh, they only have one, two, one, two, three cows. Oh, well. No, no, so it's no problem. Now, before this, I didn't put it, but they said that the, the family would gather 800 to 1,000. No way, 800 to 1,000 uh, of the slopes. So, but, I mean, so that, that would actually be for two, I mean, four cows. Or, or I mean, three cows and, and some sheep. I mean, and we know also that they have one. I have no idea. Um, <laughs> this is how much effort it is. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's like a it's a gathering blanket. It's great for us. They they had this. Uh, it's like it looks like a. I mean, like like a trough. You know, yeah. Like a that's a four. Yeah. <laughs> it is, I don't know. It's not. I don't have a tip. I have a picture. But but uh, yeah. I mean, these of course these are the reindeer lashes. They're not. Well, I think also cheese. What what uh, they don't grow very fast.
Saw research before that, but it, there was there was really just an explosion of research on the question of food sharing among uh, hunter gatherers in in the, in the last decade or so. And this, uh, you know, in any kind of research, the, the the pendulum tends to go one way, and then somebody pulls it far to this way, and eventually it comes back into the into the middle. And this is certainly uh, true of the, the question of, of sharing among hunter gatherers. In the 1950s, ethnographies on hunter gatherers would have um, not uh, talked about hunter gatherers as being terribly generous uh, people. There was, there was a sense that people tended to be keep things for themselves, keep food for themselves. This all changed in 1966 at the, the Man the Hunter uh, conference held in uh, Chicago in the, in the United States. And one of the organizers of this conference was uh, Richard Lee, who was um, a very uh, young researcher at the time, new in the field and had just been conducting his first field research with the Jiklasi uh, in uh, Botswana. That conference did a number of things. It, it took the pendulum of hunter-gatherer studies in several areas and pulled it to one far uh, extreme. One of the statements it said is that hunter-gatherers don't have territoriality. They don't recognize territorial boundaries. Uh, the other thing it said was that hunter gatherers are extremely generous people. They share their food with other families, with anthropologists. Uh, they're very generous people, especially meat. Especially meat. Meat is shared widely. Mm -hmm. Part of, part of what was happening here was the, the social context of anthropology at the, at the time. This is the 1960s, the mid-1960s. Uh, it's in the United States. Things looked pretty grim in the United States in the 1960s. We had just we were involved with the war in Viet Vietnam. Uh, there were riots going on in American cities over over the war, but also over civil civil rights. Uh, there were Kennedy had already been assassinated, and uh, soon his brother would be assassinated. Martin Luther King would be assassinated, uh, and it was all beginning in the 1960s. There's the whole counterculture movement of the the hippie generation. Um, Americans were recognizing that their um, the natural environment was being uh, polluted and dis destroyed. Uh, I grew up near the Housatonic River, which was one of the most polluted rivers in the United States. I was often pretty cleaned up, but it was, it was a mess. And people were, anthropologists were looking for some evidence that humans could live 
in better ways. And they found it among hunter gatherers. But here were people who had no territorial boundaries, who didn't have high rates of violence, uh, who were generous with, with, their, with their food. That's not entirely true. Um, I had experiences among the Nikea who, who could be perfectly nice people, but who did not share meat. As I, as I told you before, they did not like to share meat. They would do it if they had to, but they didn't want to do that. Uh, I know that there were people there who I once walked up into a community there was a woman sitting there on the ground. I saw her, as I came up to her, I saw her take her bags of tobacco that were sitting next to her. She was sitting on the ground. And she shoved them under her thigh like that. And when we came over and sat down, the first thing she said was, have you got any tobacco? <laughs> and then, here's some tobacco. I know you're sitting on tobacco, but here's some tobacco. Uh, Richard Lee, the, the, there's a nice book, um, the, the uh, biography of a woman called uh, Nisa. Maybe some of you have seen it, I don't, I don't know. It was published in 1981. Um, and it's the, it's the biography of a, of a uh, Jukasi woman named Nisa. Uh, she's a very interesting person. If you see this book, you, you, you should read it. It's very interesting. Uh, biography of them. All of the money that was made off of that book went to Nisa. She's a Bushman living in Botswana with a bank account earning royalties off of this book. And for a and that, that book is, is still in print. You can still buy it. So it's been in print for you know, more than 30, 30 years now. I don't know how much money she's made, but it has made her a fairly wealthy woman for a, a Bushman in Botswana. So Richard Lee, he did years of research <coughs> with the G Plus, and he, he told me about one of those trips that he made out there not, not too many years ago. He goes out, he knows to bring gifts for people. He shows up, oh, he gives gifts to people. He's known these people for years and years. They're happy to see him. He spends a few weeks there, and then it's time to go. And so he's packing up his tent and his sleeping bag and his other gear, and he's carrying it from his camp over to his truck and putting it in the truck. And he walks back to get another load. And Nisa comes out from her little house, and she is watching Richard Lee take this stuff away. And she starts just carrying on this public conversation. This is what they should possibly do. And she starts, she says things like, look at it. There he is. He came here with all this stuff, and now he's taking it all back. What did we get out of this? Nothing. Is it true? Yeah, brought gifts. But he's still taking some of this stuff. She's saying, look, there he goes. Look up. Well, someone could use that pot, Richard. But no, 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 no. He's going to take it back with him. So why not? Why don't you just leave the tent, Richard? Somebody could use the tent. When it rains, they'll get wet. That they'll have no place to live. They could do no, no, no. He's putting the tent in the truck. <laughs> look, look. And he goes on and on like this. And he finally walks, walks by her to get another load. And she she turns to him and says, "Oh boy," she said, "I'm sorry, Richard, but you know we have to say this to you." <laughs> <laughs> and this is the richest woman in camp. Asking him for more. Give us, give, give me more. And, and this is this is something that anthropologists have called de demand sharing. 
And, and it's true among lots of one gatherers. They demand that you share. People end up sharing, not because they, they, they're doing it out of goodness of their heart, but really because somebody insists that they share. Like my student, Graham Tucker, when he saw that in Cale with the little foot sticking out of it, and he started saying, selling, yeah, you know, how did that non-existent hedgehog taste? What he was doing was demand sharing. He was insisting that this man share with them. And that's a culturally appropriate thing to do among hunter gatherers. The same way when I would show up and they would say, can I have your shirt? Can I have your shoes? They're, they're demanding that I share with them. And I would share whatever I could, but not my, not my clothing. So we've got this, how can you say that hunter-gatherers are just very generous, good-hearted people when they're, they all insist that everybody share with them? If I'm so good-hearted, nobody should have to insist that I share with, with them. And yet, people, people do. So there's, 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 something, there's something going on. Uh, and the, one of the ways we can see it is that meat, meat from large game, always gets shared, always shared. And plant food is is almost never shared, not regularly, not regularly shared. <coughs> so th this this that was kind of the basis for people asking the question, what? determines whether food gets shared. And then and you think, well that's a pretty simple problem, isn't it? And it turns out to be a pretty complex problem and it leads us into beyond simple material things and and into the question of social power uh, and communicating social social power. How do we get there? Um, the first thing we can we can ask is, and really, how much meat gets shared? I mean, most ethnographers would would say, oh, hunter gatherers share the meat. But we didn't really know how much of it gets shared. Uh, in the 1980s. The first people to collect actual data on food sharing were uh, the researchers who worked with the uh, Anche. And the data they collected on the Anche showed that men were sharing like everything. All the meat they got, they shared it out. And they were sharing with each other so that the meat I ate was not meat that I acquired. It was meat that some other man who gave to me. Meanwhile, I gave me to him. And uh, this, a number of people started assuming this to be true of all hunter gatherers. And it's in the first edition of this, of this book, the one that's signed there. It's a mistake. Uh, but because since that time, other people have also <coughs> gathered data on exactly how much meat gets. Share and it turns out that the ache were our that's, that's the odd case, not the normal case. Among most hunter gatherers, the most a, a large portion of the meat is kept by the individual family. It stays in the family of the hunter who acquired it. Some of it will go away. Will indeed always gets shared out. But large chunks of it remain with the family. Those men are provisioning their family, wife and children. And then some of it also gets, gets shared, shared out. So what explains how much meat gets shared out and who gets it? And the, there have been four major explanations proposed for this. 
reciprocal altruism, kin selection, tolerated theft, which today is more commonly called tolerated scrounging. Do you know what scrounging is? Scrounging is uh, when you sort of um, looking looking for something. Wow, that's a hard word to define. I hadn't thought about it until just now. Yeah. It's sort of like uh, if, well, if, 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 if I'm looking around, oh, you got, you got some coffee. Have some coffee. Have some coffee. Have some, have some if you want it. Yeah, you can improve that. You got a candy bar. You got it. No, you got a candy bar. That's, that's scrounging. You know, kind of being, I'm not really threatening you, but I'm being sort of annoying by asking you for food. And you find yourself, why didn't you? Something to eat. Uh, and lastly, costly signaling. And this is the one that gets a little compl complicated. So, uh, how, how do these, how might these work? Uh, the, the first explanation was proposed by Bruce Winterhalter, who was uh, using the observation that plant foods rarely get shared and meat from large game. Is always shared to, at least to some uh, extent, and he looked at it in these these terms, asking how much variation is there in uh, a forager's success rate, the foraging success rate. How much variation is there? Think of it from day to day. How much variation is there? And how much correlation is there between the different foragers? Are they all doing just as well each day? Or uh, does one do really well and someone else does really poorly? <coughs> so he created sort of four cat categories. So here we've got a high variation from day to day, doing good, bad, good, bad. Lots of variation in how well foragers do. And there's a high correlation between them. When this person's doing well, so is this person. When this person's doing poorly, so is this, this person. High correlation. So we can then look at uh, a different situation, one where there's high variation, but where they're not correlated. When this person's doing really well, this person's doing poorly. When this person's doing poorly, this person's doing very, very well. We can go on and look at cases where there's not much variation, and those are all correlated. Good and bad days are correlated among all the different foragers. And um, the situation where there's not much variation and there's not much correlation between them. So what what Weinerhalder pointed out is you would expect a, a, some different behaviors under those different circumstances if someone was going to try and maintain as high a return rate as possible. Uh, taking into account that there's variation in how well a forager does from day to day, or you could think about it on a different time scale as, as well. And these, these two categories, this is true of large game. If you're hunting large game, you'll have lots of variation in your, in your efforts. Some days you make a kill, some days you don't. And, and if you if you hunt large game, it's not you can't you, you can't just kill part of an animal. You either kill the animal or not. It's it's you, you win or you lose. You get the animal or you don't. 
so the variation can be high. Today, I killed a buffalo. Great. Tomorrow, I killed nothing. So it's, it's up high or it's down with lots of vari variation. And uh, uh, th there's th th the correlation among the forges is we can also expect, and it, it can be demonstrated in some epigraphic cases, that those efforts aren't really correlated, that, that I can do really well and someone else can do very poorly on the same, the same day. And that's partly because the, the success rates are so are so low. You know, if your success rate is 50% for a small game, then that means on half your day you get something and the other half you don't. There's a high probability that on the days when I get something is a day when someone else gets gets not. And vice vice versa. This situation is much more true of of plants, of plant foods. A woman who goes out to gather tubers from, from hemp, she's got a pretty good idea of what she's going to get. She's going to go back to the stand of plants where she was collecting yesterday. She knows that there's lots of tubers there. She knows that um, she's going to go out for four hours, and in four hours she can collect, uh, I don't know, 10 kilos of of tubers. And she knows that any other woman who doesn't do that is probably just lazy. Now, if someone's sick or something, okay, that's, they'll, they'll gather extra for the sick person. But they won't gather more than they really need because then somebody's just going to demand share of them. And the ethnographies are clear on this. That women say, we're not, we, we don't gather a whole lot at one time because someone will just ask us for it. And then we're just working for them. Why do that? You don't have a choice when you kill a large animal. I mean, a woman can decide to bring home mm -hmm. one kilo, two kilos, three kilos, five kilos worth of tubers. She can decide that. You can't decide to bring home just part of an elk. And then tell everyone, well, the other part got away. <laughs> so, so uh, Winterhalder says you you don't share plants because you'll just end up working for someone else. But you do share uh, meat because when I make a kill, I share meat with you. And next week, when I'm having bad luck, you make a kill, you share back with, with me because of the size of the, the, the variation and the potential for failure. This, then there was a, a question raised about this. Bruce, Bruce came up with this model as sort of a hypothetical model and seemed to explain the ethnographic data as we knew that. But he proposed that model in the late 1980s, and there really were no uh, quantitative data on food sharing. But people began to collect the quantitative data uh, in the late 1980s and into the 1990s. And what uh, the ethnographers discovered was that uh, people were getting meat. They were, they were being given meat. They were being shared meat. But they were not contributing meat back. So I'm a good hunter. I come in. I share some meat out with Milton. Milton's a terrible hunter. And so he never has meat to share back with. But I still kind of share meat with Milton. So it can't just be uh, re reciprocal altruism, or at least not in terms of meat for meat, which is how we would have uh, envision it. So at first people said ah, reciprocal altruism can't be the explanation. But then other people said, you know, I could share me with Milton and maybe he's a lousy hunter, but there's other things he could do for me. He can he can still 
reciprocate. It can still give back to me, but in some other way. And indeed, what we found with folks like the Ache, um, the people who share meat, who are good hunters, give a lot of meat out. When they get sick or they have an accident, they do better than men who are poor hunters don't have the means to do the work. So, uh, I'm a good hunter. I've been sharing meat with Milton, and uh, then I get sick. He takes care of me. He makes sure that somebody else is bringing food over to feed my, my family. Right? He watches that. He's returning something to me. It doesn't have to be in terms of meat. Likewise, Holly Wiesner found that uh, men who were good hunters and who were generous, uh, they lived to be older and they lived to be older in better health than men who were poor hunters or men who were good hunters but who weren't, who weren't generous. They didn't share any more. Yeah. So it's almost like these men who are good hunters, they're sort of building up all this goodwill, and then when they're old, that's when they get the payback. This is the only long-term study we have the effects of the share. That was done by Polly Wiesner. I always tell people, anything you see by Polly Wiesner, you should read. Always interesting. Always has something to say. Always generated from uh, very good ethnographic data. Very smart person. Uh, so reciprocal altruism might explain some of it, but not in a very simple meat or meat trade. It, it, can, it can explain in terms of meat for something else, and that something else may not come. Uh, immediately, but they come some distance down the road. And that, that all sort of violates the initial model from Bruce Winterhall. That's not what he would have predicted. His, his model was really to predict very short-term sharing and repayment, not to predict sort of long-term. Another explanation is, is kin selection, that people share meat with um, people that are their close genetic relatives. So parents should share food with their children. This should not be a surprise to anybody. If you want <coughs> to have any kind of uh, uh, reproductive fitness, you should feed your children. And so you, you are, you're expected to sort of give food away in relation to how closely people are related to you uh, genetically. Maybe. This gets tricky because, of course, who people consider to be their relatives is highly variable. Um, but in addition, uh, the um, kinship distance, and I don't want to go into this formula here anymore, but the kinship distance can vary from 0 to 0.5, right? That's, that's your, your, your genes that you share with someone vary from 0 to, to 0.5. But the probability of returning a favor varies from 0 to 1. From I'm not going to return it at all to I absolutely will return it. Um, so that your 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 more likely uh, to give to to people who are going to return the the favor than you are to people who are related to you. Because when you start balancing the cost and benefit, the benefit's going to be higher for people who will, who will return the favor, whether they're related to you or not, 
than for people who are simply related to you. So uh, the folks who studied the Ache studied this very, very carefully, um, <coughs> recording how much food, especially meat, came into a village, and who shared it, how much did they share, and who did they share it with, and did those people share back with the hunter who initially gave the food. It's this enormously detailed uh, uh, analysis. And here's what they found, is that people uh, give to those kin, they give to their relatives, they give to the relatives who have the highest probability of paying back the favor. So they're they are favoring kin, but they're favoring those kin who are going to pay the favor back. So it's almost like kin selection and reciprocal altruism at the same time. But what they also found uh, was that the people who brought in the most meat into the village were also the ones giving it to those uh, families with the lowest potential to repay the favor. With the lowest potential to repay the favor. It, that's certainly not reciprocal altruism in terms of me or me. But it may be that those, those people are going to repay the favor in some other fashion. And indeed, those are probably the ones who are helping the good Ache hunters when they're sick, uh, uh, when they're injured, or as they as they get as they get older. <coughs> so there's there seems to be reciprocal altruism going on in different in different forms, but also a certain amount of kin selection. Is this uh, conscious? Oh, what do you mean? Yes, conscious. I think it's fully conscious. <coughs> Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. And they're almost certainly giving away meat that they can't really use for this reason. So um, they're finding a way, uh, it may not have much food value to them, but they're finding a way to acquire value by giving it to someone that they know now puts you in debt to me. And I don't know when you're going to pay the favor back, but it's a good thing to know that I've got these people out here who owe me. Who owe me. So th this is that leads us to this sort of third explanation here of tolerated theft or tolerated scrounging. And it's it, it's based on the realization that um, if you're hunting large game, you can't bring in a little bit of the large game. Like I said, you can't, you can't hunt a, a, a half of an elk. You can't bring in just a portion of an elk and say, I don't know what happened to the rest of it. It, ran away. it, it, it doesn't work like that. If I come in with a leg of elk, everyone knows someplace out there is the rest of the app. So I, I, I bring the whole thing in. It's more food than I can eat or that my family can eat at one, at one time. I've got extra food. The first parts of that food mean a lot to me. I get a lot of value out of it. But once I have a full stomach, the rest of it doesn't have as much value. Okay, but for somebody who hasn't eaten, that food has a lot of value, more than it has for me. So I can sort of demand share it off of you. Whoa, you got, you got, you got a, an elk. A lot of meat there. You gonna eat all that? Can I have some of that? This is, and your your choice is to tell me, no, go away. When you're, you're sitting there with a full tummy, I'm hungry, 
and you're not going to give me this obviously extra proof. There's a, you can't do that without uh, taking on a serious social cost. Because I now tell everybody, he, look, look, he's full, he's got extra food, stingy. He's stingy. And this is sort of a, one of the worst things you can say in foraging society, is you're stingy. <coughs> Yeah, uh, have you ever documented, or anyone for that matter, someone being ostracized for not complying? Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for people who hide things, yes, they do pay a price for it. It doesn't happen very often, because it's, it's considered the wrong thing to do, and because someone does pay a price for it. And what happens is, you're, if you're going to be, you will not be generous, then we won't be generous with you. And what that means is, okay, today you got an elk, but you're not going to get one tomorrow or the next day or the next day. But he will. But he knows you're stingy, so you won't share. He's not going to share with you. You, be, you will have to pay a price for being stingy. And no one wants that, uh, that, uh, that, that label. You can't afford it in these kinds of societies. I, I remember once with the Nikkei, one of the first times we were out, and we got up in the morning, and I couldn't find our, the pot that we used to cook with. Which is a real problem, and we don't have a pot to make the rice. So we're looking around, we're looking around, and I'm trying to find it. And I said something to my Malagasy colleague, Jean Pascal Rabatim. I said, Oh, maybe there's a thief in this, in this community. And Jean Pascal said, Don't, don't say that. You don't want to label somebody a thief because then you get the reputation as being somebody who will accuse someone else of being a thief. And you don't want to be accused of being the kind of person who accuses someone else of being, okay, that's a little complicated <laughs> for 6 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> And, and, and we eventually found the pot. A, a dog had dragged it from the uh, So nobody wants, everyone wants to keep a good reputation. So t tolerated theft just recognizes that the first parts of a food have lots of value to you. But at some point, the, that value declines. And the, the resource isn't. It's not worth defending because you're going to have to pay for it with a social cost. It may not be that somebody actually fights you for the food. I suppose that can happen, but nobody, nobody records that. They know I'm not going to fight for the food. There are no fights for women, but there's no fights over, over food. Uh, so, in this case, there's no there's no intent of reciprocity. You give him meat to simply maintain your reputation. You don't expect anything back from him. So it could be that some of those ache are giving meat to poor families, really to maintain their reputation as a generous person. I'm going to give food away somebody that I know cannot really pay it back. But that's because I'm a generous person. And you give generosity is admired in all cultures and you uh, eventually get rewarded for it. In this case when you for the Ache, when you're sick, for the Shikazi, when you're old, you get rewarded for having been Generous in your in your in your life. Uh, this could still be our work, though, 
And it, it can be that um, uh, hunters come in with some with food, and they immediately share it out, or share out a certain amount of it, enough so that they no one's going to call them stingy. Everyone's going to say, "Oh, he's a generous person." Of course, he kept half for himself, but no, that's okay. He gave the other half away to everybody. To everybody to it. So it could be that the possibility of of tolerated theft and the social price you pay is what motivates people to uh, to give food away. But when they do that, they can also create the desire, uh, they can create the need for people to repay that favor, either in turn as need or as some other assistance. The, the last of the explanations is called costless signaling, which I mentioned a little bit on the first or the second page. Uh, and, and this idea comes to anthropology from zoology, and it was uh, originally proposed, I think, by Darwin, although he used different, different terms, uh, in order to explain things like this elaborate male uh, uh, tales. And the, the idea here is that this male is investing energy in that tail. It takes a lot of energy. Uh, and it's his way of signaling to females, female peacocks, this is how powerful I am. I can invest my energy in this tail, and it does me no harm. And in, in order for this principle to work, there actually has to be some energetic investment. The, 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 the peacock has to actually put something into that. This is, this is known as the handicap principle. This actually has to handicap the peacock to some extent in order to say, look, I can put on this big tail. It makes me a little easier for predators to catch me. It certainly makes it easier for predators to find me. Uh, and yet, and yet, I survive. I'm still here. You should pick me as a mate. Because I will pass these, these strong genes onto our uh, offspring. So, some people have argued that sharing is a form of costly signal. It's a, it's a way for someone to go out and invest energy in an activity, hunting like the Ache, hunting and hunting, the <clears throat> hunters keep hunting, even though they've gotten enough, enough meat, bringing stuff in, bringing large animals in, and sharing it all out. By sharing it all out, it's a way of communicating to everyone very clearly, this, I got this meat, and I'm giving it to you. I could keep it for my, my family, but I can give it away, and it does me no harm. Pick me. Pick me as your, as your mate. Uh, so it has this link to human, human mate uh, behavior. And, and here's how. Uh, if, if women are looking for a husband who is going to be a good provider, they want a man who's going to demonstrate that he's a good husband. And ethnographic studies have shown that when they ask, like pods of women, what kind of man do you want to marry? One of the first things women will say is, good hunter. They may say a good provider. But by that, what they mean by that is, is a good a good hunter, because that's what men provide. Is, that's one of the first things they will say. We want to be a good hunter. That's who I intend to marry. That may not be who we want to marry, but that's who she intends to marry. 
good, a good amount. The odd thing, though, is that if men are given the lead away, they're not really good providers, are they? Why would you want a guy who's going to bring in all this meat and then give it all away? You can see the white standard going up. Oh, wait, oh, wait, 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 wait a second now. Don't give that away. And the interesting thing we've discovered is that men who are really good hunters, they always end up marrying women who are good gatherers. They become the, in English we would call them the power couple, couples. You know, husband and wives were both very, very good at what they, at what they do, right? They're in control of every, everything. So there's some question about who exactly is the provider in the, in the, in the family. We know that a lot of the meat resides in the family, so it's the men who are, they're providing some food into the family. But it's not just them, it's that they also marry women who are very good gatherers, who are hardworking, who will spend time out uh, to gather a little more food than other, other women are, are gathering. Uh, it, it, the costly signaling here may be a way for a man to communicate to a, a potential wife, I'm a good provider, but it's also a way for him to acquire other male political talents. Men who will want to be affiliated with him, with me, because I'm a good hunter. And I will share some of my meat out with those, with those men. <clears throat> So a woman may be looking for a man who's a good provider, but also a man who's capable of building up the alliances with other men who are going to repay the favor either in meat or in some other fashion, which will benefit, ultimately benefit her, her offspring. So which is it? Oh, and it, it, Studies have shown that men who are good hunters have higher reproductive success than men who are, are not. I've got five or six studies see this now. But remember, it, it, the men who are good hunters have married women who are good gatherers. So who is it? Well, it's probably both of them together. Which is it? You have good hunting ability. It could be a way to acquire social status through costly signaling uh, and sharing meat out to people. It can be a way to provision your family. Uh, that helps do you all sorts of things, the end result of which is increasing your biological fitness by, uh, it can be you extra mating opportunities. It can uh, help provide you with help in child care when you're not so sick or when you're away. Um, it can uh, help with other men who may not challenge you because you're the guy bringing most meat in and I'm benefiting from that. So even though I don't like what you're doing now, I'm not going to fight you on it because I don't want to lose this source of meat. Uh, it can be a way to acquire uh, a wife or maybe an additional wife. All of this is going to have an effect on both your fertility as well as your child's survivorship and your own and your spouse's survivorship, which only helps your child's survivorship, all of which increases your biological fitness. What this means is we can't Although we can propose four different explanations to explain sharing, we can't rule out any one of them. They all appear to be working either simultaneously or one of them may be working a little more strongly at different points in a person's life than at, than at other points in that, in that person's life. So it's a rather complicated problem that the end result is we can just say all of the explanations proposed seem to account for some of the of the sharing behavior that we see 
And all of them appear to link together to increase biological
say hunter-gatherer territoriality. It says hunter-gatherer land tenure. And I prefer that term because territoriality refers to a very particular kind of behavior. And that behavior is where there's some uh, piece of land that belongs to me or my group and you can't come in here. Period. That, that, that's just one of the ways that people can relate to land. So rather than call this hunter-gatherer territoriality, I call it hunter-gatherer land tenure. The word tenure just refers to more generally how do hunter-gatherers relate themselves and other people to, to geographic space. Uh, so one of the one of the early models proposed was proposed by uh, Rada Dyson Hudson and uh, Eric Eric Smith. This was <coughs> Eric Smith I, I mentioned on the second day. He and Bruce Winterhall, those were the ones who really uh, brought evolutionary ecology into uh, anthropology. So uh, he wrote this paper while he was a graduate student at Cornell. And they, they really just sort of sat down and, and thought about under what conditions would we expect to see true territoriality, that, that is uh, the, the appearance of a system of land tenure in which uh, certain people were the only ones allowed to use a certain piece of, of land. And just to go through it simply, they, they looked at density, resource density, food, food density on a landscape from low to high. And they looked at how predictable is that resource from high to low. It's a very similar chart that we saw to uh, uh, that, that Bruce Winterwald we used in talking about sharing. And what they pointed out was that the only time that territoriality is really uh, expected 
is when you have high resource density and high resource predictability. There's no point in defending uh, a piece of land that has very low resource density. It's like me saying, I've got one little piece of cheese up here, and by golly, none of you are going to have it, right? Why, why bother? It's just one little piece of cheese. So, uh, But there's also no point in defending uh, land that uh, whose resources are not very predictable. It's like me standing here saying, there might be a piece of cheese behind me, and I'm not going to let any of you have it. I don't really know if there is one. So the only time when it's really worth the effort is, is when you've got high resource density and high predictability. So this, this would be true of, say, very large uh, streams in northwestern North America that saw predictable runs of large runs of sand up those up those uh, uh, rivers in the in, in the fall. And they were able to show that this pattern is, you know, seems to explain the appearance of true territoriality in a few ethnographic uh, cases. But that true territoriality is really rare <coughs> ethnographically among the human gathering peoples. It just doesn't show up very, very often. And instead, uh, ethnographic data, more, more um, uh, better ethnographic work, showed that there were uh, places that people considered to be theirs, but they considered to be their land. But that's not where they spent their entire lives, or even where they spent a good portion of their lives. This, this diagram here is, is showing some uh, areas that different groups of, uh, uh, these are Jutoisi, Different groups of Jutwazi considered to be to be theirs. So there were people who considered themselves to be Dobe people, and, and the, the, the way that they would acquire that the the right to call themselves Dobe people it is, has to do with what their parents have access to. So it's a little complicated social. But, and then there were others who were Tangwa people, or Kube people, or Moshe people. Uh, that this is what they consider to be their land. But <coughs> these dots here, these show the movements, the area covered by uh, about four different Dobe families in one year. They didn't just stay here. They went sort of all over the place. And some of those places they went to encompass land that the Kaimwa or the Bate or the Kube would have considered to be theirs. So they're not restricting themselves to one area, and they're moving fairly widely over territory that belongs to some other group of, of, of people. Um, and this is much more typical of of most ethnographically known hunter, hunter gatherers. And in fact, the, the land that most hunter gatherers use is really too big for them to really defend the borders. It's, it's impossible. If you've got a small group of people, 25 or 30 individuals, and they're moving over land that covers 500 square kilometers. How do you, how do you, you can't patrol the borders. You can't really keep people, people out. You don't have to keep them out, but uh, maybe you can leave it. Sometimes places open. So, and for instance, if you build a dark room, that's a uh, hundred feet or something like that, 
Well, the first one is that uh, when you read the phrase, but we are we have got this that we have got hundreds. It means that we we are quite a large number, and uh, maybe the people who know all this, they but they agree to the phrase. But maybe they know that. You will come here for the next four or something. I suppose that could happen, but ethnographically we don't see that happen. We don't see people marking territories until it's really true territoriality. When boundaries do get marked in California, Native people of California in places would mark their boundaries or they put special marks on trees. And it, it was all a way of telling people, you should not go past this tree. This, this is our terror, 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 territory. And when you see that happen, when you see edges being marked, it's, it's the, the beginnings of people trying to patrol Borders, but the territories in California were very small when you compare to other countries. So you don't you don't see that kind of marking happening unless it's accompanied with true territoriality, where I can cross this border, but if I'm caught, I'm going to pay very big price. Uh, and for most hunter gatherers, they couldn't do that. Uh, but they also seem to know where boundaries are. I was once out with a decayed man. We were walking through the forest, and it's it's completely flat. Their environment is just flat. There's, and we stopped at a place in the forest that there's nothing special there. And he turned to me and he said, "We just we just walked into Bailey territory." Maybe it was a community that was a few kilometers away. There was nothing there to tell me that we had crossed a, a boundary. So he apparently knew that he had walked far enough. He was no longer in sort of his group's territory. He was in Bailey. But it didn't matter. It didn't matter. We kept on walking. He didn't seem worried. <clears throat> what happens twice is it's just in Botswana or somewhere. Yeah, oh, yeah. 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 It's for instance, some of these ranges, it's, it's part of for instance, like diamond miners. Or, uh, but what will, how will they respond if they have to move in another group's territory? Or where do they go? Uh, is there, for instance, in this case, I, mean, I know that for this one rule, how people act, but in, uh, in this particular case, well, in this particular case, people have the, they can go onto someone else's land. It's okay for people from Dobe to walk onto <coughs> land that the Congo would consider to be their land. It's, it's okay to do that. Uh, but you, you need to have permission. And for most hunter gatherers, if you ask for permission, it will be given. But you must ask. So this is this is actually a, a picture from Central Australia of the uh, Arendt in 1901. Now this is a group, another group that's come to meet another another residential group. And this is part of the, the whole ceremony that they go through. And basically what they're there to do is to ask for permission to go forage on this group's land, land that belongs to them. Not only the land that belongs to them, it's the resources that belong to them. 
and they have the right to be asked to use those resources. And there's always the assumption that if, if you ask it for permission, it, it will be granted. That's, that's the assumption they're operating. They have big elaborate ceremonies for asking for permission. And it, it all looks kind of aggressive. These guys have all got their spears and their, their shields. And they go through this whole uh, elaborate dance. That all of that is to tell this other group, we're pretty powerful. You, you should give us permission. We don't want us angry at you. Um, <coughs> And this is this is what's what uh, Elizabeth Cashton labels social boundary defense. You don't guard the the actual limits of your territory because that's physically impossible to do. What you guard instead is access to your social group. So and access to social groups. This is where we can get really complicated into, uh, into, into kinship. Uh, and for the Australians, <coughs> what these men will try and do is demonstrate to the owners of this the territory they're entering, is to demonstrate that they have a connection to them. And the, the words that they use in the, in the pidgin English that they speak, they refer to it as one country. They will try and explain to the host group that you and I are one country. One country. You and I are one country. Uh, and there's a lot of ways that they can create that, that tie, that link. Um, you might do it in the, in the book. I give you like there's like ten different. No, there's more than ten different that you can do. It. Uh, you can. I told you last time that the Australian Aborigines have this dream time. See this myth of the past, and there were these creatures that did have remarkable adventures, and they left signs of those adventures in the geography of in the, the, the landscape of Australia. These dreamtime tracks that they're called sometimes intersect with each other. So one of these men might argue that, ah, I was conceived on the lizard dream time And you were conceived on the buzzard dream time track. Those dream time tracks intersect with each other there in the desert. You know this to be true. Therefore, we are one country. Because I was conceived on a dream time track that intersects with the dream time track where you were conceived. I don't know if you know where you were conceived, but I don't know where I was conceived. But that's important information to them. Or they may say, my father was born on a dream contract where your father was born. That makes us one country. Or they might say, uh, we can get really wild. They can say, my father's mother was conceived on a dream contract where your father's father was born, that makes us one country. In, in other words, there's almost certainly some way that I can argue that you and I have this special connection. Even if we've never met, we can kind of figure out how we're connected. And what this allows people to do is to try and negotiate. Are, are you going to run into the land? And the incoming group is going to try and explain to you why you really have to give us permission. Because we're one country. We're the same people. And you may be sitting there thinking, I 
can't I can't afford to let these guys come in because there's been a drought, there's not much food here. So you have to start arguing. No, no, that doesn't that doesn't count. No, no, no. Your mother was conceived at the same dream contract as my grandfather was conceived. No, 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 that doesn't that doesn't count. That's too distant. And I don't I'd love to hear these conversations. But that's, they're going to try and argue that we have this social connection. <coughs> and and the, the reasons can get quite uh, uh, from our perspective would be quite odd, quite, quite, quite strange. But that's, they're arguing things in terms of where you're born, where you're conceived, where your relatives were born and conceived, and how they relate to the dream time. In the end, they're, it's, they're probably going to give their permission. Because if they don't give them permission, then next year, when things are bad for my group, and I want to go move in with them, they're going to say, no, you didn't give us permission. So this is a way to create debts, just like sharing. It's a way to create debts. And it's a way to work it, even if you can't. It's a way to defend your territory without having to physically defend the boundaries of it, because you can't, you can't physically do that. This is the more common form of, of, of land tenure among ethnographic hunter gatherers, rather than true ter territorial. So what, what conditions, whether this is likely to happen? Well, we can actually, this is no different than sharing. This, this is no different than sharing. Because when I'm sharing food out, I'm really sort of giving you permission to eat this piece of food that's actually mine. I acquired it, but I'm going to give up the rights to it. I'm going to give you permission to eat it. This is the same. It's the same behavior. So we can evaluate it using the same, the same tools. So we can go back to Winterholm's <coughs> model of of sharing, where we were looking at how much variation is there. In this case, we can think of it as variation from year to year, rather than day to day. And how much correlation is there between? the fluctuations in food resources in my territory as opposed to your territory. So what we might expect in places where there's rather high variation, but also high correlation in the returns from foraging in our separate ter territories, that's where you might expect people to be storing lots of food, where you might expect to see a, a defense of the, the perimeter, a, a defense of your territory. It's where you might see warfare, and it's where you might see slavery. Where of all the bad stuff happens. Why? Because when I'm doing really well, my neighboring group is also doing well. They don't need me. But when they're doing poorly and they need me, I'm also doing poorly. <laughs> I can't afford to help them. So this is when you get defense of borders and you get warfare. Those two go together. You don't invest energy in defending the borders if no one wants to come in. There's no point in building a big wall if nobody wants to come in. That only happens when somebody is going to take what you have. And they're going to take what you have probably because they're they're desperate. So we expect social boundary defense where there's lots of fluctuation, but where 
my territory is, it, it is sort of not, what's the word I want to use here? They're not in sync. They're not fluctuating on the same, in the same way. So that when I'm doing really poorly, you're doing really well. You can afford to help me. And you will want to, because when you're doing really poorly, I'll be doing really well. So you want to build up a debt so that you can call in that at some time in the, in, the, in the future. So we would expect that to happen where there's high variance, but where there's low correlation between that variance, where we expect social boundaries to present itself. And it's also where we'd expect to see lots of things like gift exchange, um, items moving across the landscape, because these are ways that people um, establish ties between each other. That Australian Aboriginal group that they are given permission, which almost certainly happens, they will almost certainly give some gifts to the host group. And that will entail things, maybe tools made out of stone that's only found in their territory. So that in the future, someone has an actual physical reminder of the debt that's made. Remember, when you came and gave me this really nice spear point made out of that stone that's only in your territory? Well, now I need a favor. And here's a, this, a, a reminder that you owe me a favor. It involves a past, because it's really useful. The past in They would still remember as the gathers of early. They remember things. Oh yes. They'll remember things and they, they operate in terms of these debts and obligations. I mean, we do too. We do too, but that's, that's a much more primary form of relationship to them than, than for us. Mm -hmm. The first time I went to Madagascar, I, I contacted the photographer, Franz Lofton, I mentioned. Very famous wildlife, or most of those wildlife. But he had taken some pictures of the Nikkei. And uh, I, I happened to find those before we made our first trip. And I, I contacted Franz Lund. I managed to get his phone to call him up just to say, Tell me any, what can you tell me about this part of Madagascar? And you can tell me anything that you know. I was just trying to get all the information I could before I went. And so he gave me lots of help information. And I told him that I, I tracked him down because I had seen the pictures that he had taken from the UK that were published in National Geographic magazine. And um, so he said, can you do me a favor? I'll try. And he said, can you make, can you take, you know, one of those National Geographic, cut the pictures out, and bring them to the people that you can take? Yes. And he said, because I told them I would get them some pictures back to them, but I don't have any way to do it. And mail the, the operator. So I 
So I said, yeah, sure, I can do that. Got a copy of a couple of pictures of that. I actually had a uh, black laminated plastic laminated, so they were completely strong. And I took them in, and I found the people that were in the photos. And, oh, this is you. Franz Lofton, the photographer. Oh, <laughs> right? And there was one guy I brought in photos. This is it's you. Oh, yes, yes, I remember that. You know, when Franz was here and took this picture, he wanted to go fishing. And I gave him some fishing line. I never, I never got the fishing line back. Did Franz give you anything else for me? No. Oh, OK. Now I, I, I've got to go buy some fishing line and get to this guy. <laughs> so yeah. I said, oh yeah, you're right. Yeah, Franz asked me to replace that fishing line that he took to me four or five years ago. I'll, I'll get you some fishing line. I somehow managed to find some place where I could buy some fishing line. And then he said, anything else? Did Franz send anything else for me? That was a request for money. So I said, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. so here's 5,000 now, I guess, in francs, which is it's about two euros. Uh, if you wanted to, you have this too. Oh, thank you. And then he was like, can you remember what Franz Lafayette told you? I couldn't get it from France, but I had a connection to France, so he was saying, he said, I, I now believe. That's, that's not something that we have a lot of good information on. Yes. 
But in most cases, for nomadic And there are different practices for that. Sometimes they're buried in the ground, sometimes they're buried up in trees, or in a scaffold, on a platform, or in Wyoming, the people would often uh, bury people in the cracks in the rock, but tie the body up and then put it in the crack. And those aren't preserved. Sometimes people don't like going where near where someone died. Uh, but once once that dead person is forgotten, then nobody nobody knows. Because Joel dies with the Probably buried. Oh, oh, there's probably some kind of ritual in this room. It's a highly variable, very cultural thing. So, uh, yeah, there'll be some kind of thing. Everyone has some kind of ritual. Symbols, elaborate, but I've never really bothered to sort of catalog all of those those things. <coughs> so the, the point of this though is that we can recognize that there's variability among uh, hunter gatherers and how they relate to land, but we can understand that that variation using the same models that we use to uh, understand uh, some of the sharing behavior among hunter gatherers because it's really the same thing. We're just sharing the right to use the land. <coughs> saying we want to forage within your ter ter territory without without us having a problem, without us fighting. And and the host group will probably tell that visitor group it's it's okay. And they may coordinate where they're going to go. They probably won't all get together. That would be too large a group for any one area. So they'll probably go in different places. And they may coordinate, we're going here, you go over there. And the question you might have is, why why bother asking for permission? Why not just uh, uh, trespass? Why not just go use someone else's land? If it's so big, can't I just go use this part of it and no one will know that I'm there? Well, maybe. Maybe you won't get caught, but you probably will, because people will see the smoke from your fires. And even if it's many miles away, 
they'll see the smoke and go, who is that? They'll, they'll know there are other groups in their territory, but they're there, they're there, they're there. Who is that? And they'll go look and find out. Or someone may be out on a long trip hunting and find tracks. Just like the man who tracked me in the Nikkei Forest. They'll find tracks and go, who is it? And they could look at those tracks and go, I don't know what group this is. And they'll follow it, find out who that was. And you get caught using land, but you didn't ask permission. Uh, that's when fighting could happen. Um, they, you, you will, the visiting group will probably lose, and they'll have to leave the land. Now you can't ask for permission. Broke the rules, you can't ask for permission. You have to go back to your, your land. You, you, you could lose big. I mean, the, the potential is too big. So everyone always asks for permission. And they assume that the permission is going to be granted. And they assume that the reason they will get permission is because they now have a debt. Então, vai isto é muito certo, tem que contar aqui o meio que as pessoas são relacionadas, não tem nada a ver com a gente. As social relations change. You now become a group that can't be trusted. So you can never ask for permission in the future. Because you can't be trusted. So it's... So tomorrow is Friday. Uh, we, tomorrow we have to talk about a couple of things and then put all of this together to understand the uh, evolution of non egalitarian forages from egalitarian forages. Solve that great mystery. <laughs> Thank you.